Thanks for having me. I'm, to I'm very honored to be here tonight. Uh, we've got a bunch of information to go through, and so buckle up. Um, how many of you are married and with your spouse tonight here? Oh my gosh, okay. How many left your spouse home like I did? Okay, okay. And we'll talk about singles uh, in just a, a bit here. I want to get a couple of points out of the way, and then, uh, then we'll get going through the PowerPoint. The first one is, uh, like all of you physicians vow to do no harm, that's the first thing I want to do tonight, is do no harm. And you might think, what in the heck is this guy going to show us? Uh, but I think what has happened many times when I've given a marital presentation and that might exclude you guys, but there is a temptation to receive this information and lean over to your spouse or take the PowerPoint presentation home tonight and say, honey, take a look at slide 24. You've got a little work to do. So that's the last thing I'd want you to do. If you can receive this information as maybe something you could work on a little bit, we'll, we'll avoid the fights, and I won't drum up a bunch of business, uh, which is not my intention here. Also, a couple of other points. This information can be useful in, in many ways. Uh, there's many things we'll talk about tonight that can be helpful with regards if you're a parent, uh, if you have friends, if you have any relationships at all, some of this information will be helpful. Many of you as physicians have opportunities. One of the things I've noticed as I videotape our residents' encounters with patients is patients tend to listen to physicians much more than they do psychotherapists. I guarantee you that. And so some of the information you could use tonight might be helpful to share with patients that might be struggling with relationships and family dynamic uh, information. One last thing, last but not least, singles. Uh, if you're single and, and searching, this information may help you choose much wiser, which is a good thing, but it also might scare the hell out of you and it might re you might remain single for the rest of your life. So I'm just giving you a warning right now. If you want to take an exit, you can, but the information hopefully will be health helpful for, for most of you. Uh, let's have fun. I'd like to keep it somewhat interactive. This is kind of a, a, a big group, but I might throw out some questions and if I get some feedback back, I'll just re uh, repeat it so everyone can hear, but I'd like to keep it uh, somewhat interactive as well. So let's dive in. There's the obligatory slide. I have no conflict of interest. So I usually like to start with the bad news first. And the interesting thing is uh, 20 years ago when I was giving a, a similar type of presentation, the information was not that good for physician marriages. The problem was there was a, a study done back east with a very small population of physicians that indicated that physician marriages were some of the worst in the country in terms of divorce. But it was based on a very small population. I won't even tell you where it is. You can look it up. Um, but what happened is that got repeated time and time again. And long story short, I want to tell you that there's not a lot of bad news. There's actually, the good news about the bad news is there's a lot of good news with regards to physician marriages. So in general, physician marriages are trending much like uh, the general population. So let's go to the next slide. The data is a little bit mixed. Let's read through this. Past research suggested that physician marriages were about 10 to 20 percent more likely to get divorced than the general population. It's not good news. But again, this was based on a very small study. Recently, I won't go into all the research, but recently they've looked at census data, which included hundreds of thousands of people. And what they found is that Recent research suggests that physician marriages for the past 20 years are trending much more like the general population. And if you think that's a bad thing, you're wrong. It's a good thing. In general, uh, divorces, divorce rates are actually going down. Any guesses to when they peaked? Divorce rates. 
Anyone want to yell out a decade when they peaked? Uh, the decade I'm talking about. 1990s. 70s. Someone said the 70s. 19s. No, you're fine. Uh, in the 1970s. And ever since then, it's been kind of trending down. And the research behind how they figure out divorce rates is very complicated. And, but in general, uh, we peaked in the, in the 70s around 45%. We've been trending down recently. So that's a good thing. There's two sides, every marital therapist that tends to work with physicians, which I started working with physicians about 20 years ago. Uh, one of the concerns, and I think this is just general knowledge, is that the physician's workload and dedication to their job and the energy that goes into learning and their patient care and on call and all those types of things tends to take away energy from the family. It's kind of a no-brainer. That, that generally is what what happens. And so there's kind of two sides of the coin of most physician life. They have qualities, you know, qualities that make for an excellent physician, dedication to the pursuit of knowledge, commitment to patient, attention, attention to detail, thoroughness, willing, willingness to work for long periods of time can sometimes be so demanding that it takes energy away from the family. And that's where a lot of times we see some problems. That work-life balance issue for a lot of physician marriages is one of the difficult things to navigate. Look at the recent divorce rates. You guys do not look too bad here. Non-health care professionals, 35%. Nurses, 33%. You can read down the list. Lawyers, we've got lawyers beat. That's probably a good thing, 27%. Physicians, all the way down to 24%. So this is based on census data and a report of whether or not you uh, have ever been divorced. So those rates will kind of slowly creep up as, as you age, but those are pretty good. That's pretty good data for physicians. And frankly, I just ran into this about a year ago, looking at this data, and it, it mildly surprised me. Other statistics, physician marital satisfaction is strongly associated with time spent awake, not asleep, time spent awake with the physician partner. So meaning the more the better on that one. And the number of nights per week on call, the less the better on that one. So don't come to me about talking to your partners about on call weeks if you're having marital problems. but. That's what the data suggests, is time spent awake with your partner tends to be a good thing. Uh, a bunch of on-call nights tend to be more challenging. Physician satisfaction has not been shown to be associated with total hours worked. We'll talk about that in a second. Specialty area, except for this small study that I was mentioning, and uh, psychiatrists and surgeons kind of took a hit there. But again, it was based on uh, just that one, one data, when you look at the census data, that doesn't happen. And then, or practice setting. Dual physician marriages tend to have more time challenges, obviously, because they're both pulled at both ends of the rope. However, those marriages tend to have a lot more empathy, or they have an easier time speaking the same language and have empathy about on-call nights and being called in, etc. Okay? Other stats. Don't shoot the messenger. Female physicians are more likely to report being divorced than male physicians. Female physicians report making greater professional adjustments than male physicians to accommodate household responsibilities. So again, that work-life balance tends to be a much more challenge for female physicians than male physicians. Okay, don't want to start a gender war here, but that's kind of what the data is, is, uh, is showing. The good news, and I'd like you to participate with me a little bit here, but this is what some of the data suggests, the good things about being in a physician marriage. Good income, positive standing in the community, in-home medical advice, that can be good and bad, hard to say. Practiced at delayed gratification. You may not know this, but psychology has one you know, real good scientific fact. The rest is, we're pretty, we're pretty much a soft science. 
But that one fact is people that are good at delayed gratification tend to do better in all areas of their life. So what I mean by this is that physicians going through all the schooling and hanging in there, you're, you're pretty, and your uh, partners are pretty darn good at that delayed gratification thing, which can be very helpful. Tend to marry later, which we'll talk about that. I know we're in Utah, we'll have some controversy over that, but we'll talk about that. And education is associated with lower divorce rates. The more education you have, generally lower divorce rates. So all those things are good. So I want to throw out that question, what are some of the benefits? You guys are the ones that are living it. What are some of the benefits of being within a physician marriage that I haven't listed here? Or have I nailed it? Any other benefits? Yes. Okay, more job stability. Yeah, I would agree with that. Most of you agree with that, absolutely. Anything else? Okie dokie, let's move on. Okay, additional good news. Now, the past 40 years, relationship, marital relationship, we have a ton of science that now we know what healthy couples do to thrive. And so if we know what that is and we're able to apply that, uh, we can have much more lower divorce rates and just more thriving relationships. So, I, sorry, I got kind of carried away with the PowerPoint skills, but uh, so this information leads to uh, more love. Isn't that nice? Okay, so choosing wisely. Let's dig into the data. So let's first start with uh, how to choose partners. So now some of you are single and maybe, uh, you know, on the hunt, so to speak, looking uh, for a partner. So uh, listen up. These are important. And some of you probably broke every rule in the book here and still have a thriving relationship. So take it for what, what it's worth. But here's what the data suggests with regards to choosing wisely. This is something that my 25-year-old and 20-year-old uh, children tend to roll their eyes at because they've heard it so many times. But please spend at least four seasons with your partner before committing to anything crazy like marriage. Now I know half of you in here probably broke that rule, so I've just offended a few folks. But in general, what's the benefit of spending four seasons with someone before really kind of making that commitment? Yell it out. What's the benefit? What's that? You see everything. You see everything. We hope. Maybe not everything, but uh, we, we, we see them in different uh, systems with different people, etc. Any other benefit? Yes. Okay, <laughs> you get to know their families and maybe do some genetic testing, maybe, and kind of <laughs> get some background there. Yes, absolutely. I just met with a patient yesterday who uh, was in the Midwest, she's from Utah, in the Midwest, met a guy that she really liked. Within three weeks, uh, they, they were living together, and everything looked really, really good. And about a year into it, she started finding out he had 15 other girlfriends and was kind of uh, sifting money off the side from her bank account. Um, sad story. We talked about the four seasons and she said, oh, don't even talk. It's gonna be about 18 seasons before I commit to it. <laughs> so it's very important to just take your time and, uh, and see who you're, you see them in all different contexts. Here's some interesting data, and, and again, I think Utah's a little bit of an anomaly here. We marry much younger than this. This is national data, but look at this. If you marry before the age 20 and never obtain a bachelor's degree, you have nearly a 51% chance of divorcing. That's pretty high. If you marry at 25 or older and obtain a bachelor's degree, you have about a 19% chance of marrying. What are you seeing there? Those are some pretty large stats. When I first read that, I was like, what? So what's your assumption? What might be going on there? What do you think? What's up? It's harder. It's harder. Why? 
oh, smarter. Okay, so, yes, education, education has shown the more education you get, uh, less divorce rates, so, so that's good. 40 year olds? Is that what? Oh, sowing your oats, okay, who said that? Yes, are you sowing your oats? You've already did, okay. Uh, yeah, there is something, I'm gonna show you another slide that shows you that there is kind of a Goldilocks era a period where you have the lowest chance of divorce if you marry within that age. Now, my mom married at age 18 to her 20 year old boyfriend and they had one of the most fabulous marriages that I've ever seen. So you have to be careful with stats, but these are just generalizations. Be mindful of major differences in socioeconomic backgrounds, age, religion, preferences, or religious preferences, and cultural backgrounds. It, most people marry neighborhood spouses, meaning not next door, but in general kind of similar cultural backgrounds. That isn't necessarily a must, but if you are marrying someone where you have major differences in those areas, you're going to have to work at it. You're going to have to communicate. You're going to have to work at it a little bit harder. Here's an interesting stat that I just ran, ran into, and this is uh, the Goldilocks effect here. So I know in the back, with my eyes, I couldn't read this. So let me, let me kind of point this out. So this first little band right here, this is estimates of divorce within the first five years of marriage for the first marriage, okay? So this first blue line right here it are people that are under 20. So within the first five years of marriage, they almost have a 40% chance of divorce, fairly high. This uh, yellow mark right here, 27%, those are folks that are 20 to 24, okay? Still pretty high, but it's going down. Looks like the area right here, this area right here is pretty good. And that is 25 to 29, is that? My eyes are going on me. And then the other green one right here is 30 to 34. There's, uh, that obviously doesn't mirror uh, Utah statistics, but this is kind of national data from 2011 to 2013. It, What's kind of interesting, maybe you can tell me what, what do you think is happening here, but we have a little bit of a curve that goes right here. What's your guess? What's going on there? So we know marrying young is not the best idea because we grow, we change, etc., cetera, and, and a lot of things change during those years. But what do you think is happening with a little bit of a bell curve starting to happen? Any? Yeah, yeah, there's a sweet spot there for sure. But as we get a little bit older, what might happen? Why does that become a little more difficult? Yes, you're set in your ways. It's hard to blend blueprints, so to speak. So doesn't mean that you have to go home and put this in front of your teen's face, uh, you know, and really kind of go through this. But in general, that's what the data is suggesting, is that there is uh, somewhat of a, a Goldilocks effect there. There's a, there's a good age to marry. marry. Let's look at choosing uh, your partners wisely. Here's various traits that are very helpful. And I'm just gonna put them up here and then we'll briefly talk about them. They look like Girl Scout, Boy Scout types of uh, uh, traits here. But the number one predictor of marrying a good partner is the number one item right here. If they're kind and generous. And that can be measured in a lot of different ways but that always comes out as being a, a very good pr predictor for marriages that can thrive. The other one's open-mindedness and ability to compromise. That, that's kind of a no-brainer. Non-defensive and approachable. Let me ask you a question. Who gets to determine whether or not you're approachable? Other people. What do you think? Who gets to determine that? It's a trick question. Yourself. Yourself. Okay, we get to determine the behavior, but who gets to define whether or not we're approachable? Partner. Let me give you a quick example. Early on, I've been married for 26 years, and so far, my wife's not here because sometimes she'll stand up and contradict me, so we've kept her home. Um, 
But uh, no, we have, we have a great marriage last time I checked. But early on in, in our marriage, I, have, I come from a pretty hard-hitting, sarcastic family. And, uh, and I'm also male. And so my communication style is a little bit teasing and sarcastic and, and hard-hitting. And I do that mostly with friends. That's how, you know, with, with guys, a lot of times you're not saying, boy, where'd you get those slacks? You look great today. It's, you know, you're kind of giving them a little bit of crap here and there. And so early on, about three months into my marriage, I still remember the day she's walking in front of me and I'm kind of doing that sarcastic thing. And because she's my friend, right? Best friend, lover, spouse, etc. And so I'm doing that and all of a sudden she turns around and she has this tear coming down her face. And I probably said something smart alecky like, you know, is that hay fever season or what's going on here? Uh, and she said, she said just one sentence to me, you can't talk to me that way. And I went, what way? And she educated me about how to communicate with her. I, can't, I, I can still kind of play around with her, but I can't treat her like one of my guy friends. It doesn't work. So she determines my approachability because I was not being that approachable with the way I was communicating. Does that make sense? Okay. So your partners can define whether or not you're approachable. Integrity and trust, self-worth, and commitment to personal and relationship growth. Those are the traits that we usually find in couples that are thriving. Next little slide here. Again, a little tough for you that don't have 20-20 uh, vision, but uh, I get asked this more than almost anything else, particularly with people that are single or just getting divorced, is how and where do you meet people in Utah? <laughs> I didn't get that when I worked in Illinois or whatever, but I get a lot of that. What, what do you do? And so, you know, I don't have a lot of, I married my blind date. So I, I'm, I'm old school. I don't know how uh, people meet. But this is the data with regards to heterosexual U.S. couples and where they met their spouses. First one up there is through friends, although that is taking a dive. Which one do you see really taking a spike? Online. Online. Now, when I was a marital therapist, way back in about 1995 when the internet started happening in those early 90s. Couples started coming in and started talking about these, little, these dating sites online. And I was just like, a little part of me was dying when I, when I heard that. I, I couldn't believe this, this was happening. And I totally thought it would just kind of go away. Guess what? Here to stay, and I will say legitimate. But you have to be careful, and I'm not an expert at it, uh, but uh, that is definitely trending up. That's the steepest climb uh, we have. So also through friends is a big one. What's taken a hit is uh, family, neighbors, and church. Not a lot of people are meeting uh, folks through that, uh, f through those mediums. So we've got an uptick on bars and restaurants online and uh, through friends is still one of the main ones, okay? Same-sex couples in the U.S. since 85, can see a big difference. Online is enormous, and the rest of these through friends is kind of taking a hit. Bar restaurants kind of going up a little bit. Again, the other ones are down. I just thought it was kind of interesting data to uh, see how people are meeting. Okay, six common traits of couples that are thriving. There is physical attraction between uh, the partners, so that's kind of a no-brainer. The next one here, is the relationship out of clear choice or versus obligation or fear of being alone? Now, what's, what's the problem with choosing a partner when you are afraid to be alone? What are some potential problems that might happen? Or one potential problem? You choose badly because you're desperate. So I personally think it's probably better to be healthy and single than in a really abusive, bad relationship. So, so be careful with uh, the obligation and fear of being alone. Share fundamental values, beliefs, interests, and goals. I work with a lot of couples that are interfaith marriages. Mormon and Jew, Catholic and Hindu, uh, active Mormon, Mormons that left, 
you know, all, all sorts of combinations, which can be very scary, right, when you're raising kids. But I have found those that tend to be, I, I was raised in a mixed uh, faith uh, family. And one of the things that was very helpful, and the research t tells us this is helpful, is that if couples can look at their shared values and how they want their kids to turn out, those types of things, they can get through the differences of dogma and creed generally. It's difficult, um, but in general, if you look at those shared values, it's very important. Able to express anger directly and resolve differences through communication and compromise. We're going to talk about that in, here in just a sec. Experience laughter, fun, pleasure, and play with each other. I just realized that kind of sounded a little bit odd, but uh, we'll talk about sex in just a, a little bit. And the last one here, able to express support for each other and support each other's activities and interests and beliefs. Okay? Pretty non-brainer stuff, but this is when we're looking at thriving couples, this is what we're finding. Now, the pharmaceutical companies would go nuts over a pill that did the following. Helped you live longer, better physical, mental health, happier, more sex, better sex, increased wealth and more success in their careers, heal from wounds and surgery quicker, Children are more emotionally stable and academically successful. Guess what that is? That's a healthy marriage that does all of those. Now initially when this book came out, The Case for Marriage in 95, uh, the research suggested that just being married actually did this for people. But as they looked at the research and they went a little bit deeper into it and got a little more nuanced, it's actually just not being married or in a committed relationship what it is is being in a good enough or better marriage. If you're in an, in an ambivalent or an abusive relationship, obviously those types of benefits do not come around for you. So there is this marriage pill. If you're in a good, healthy relationship, it really benefits you in a lot of ways. So that's why for the next several minutes, we're going to be looking at the skills that can be health, helpful to help your relationships thrive. Okay, before I get into the big five, I want to say there's one thread that threads all of these five skills together. And it's going to sound like a no-brainer, but I don't see it a lot in the couples that I work with as they come in for marital therapy. And that is for both people to intentionally and consistently provide effort into nourishing the marriage. So let me repeat that. So when both people are going to have their eye on the ball and they're putting in effort to nourish the relationship, what happens most of the time, marriages often die by ice and cooling than by fire or big bombs. And what I mean by that is many people get married and they think, my work is done here. And generally, just like a garden you might till out back, generally we'll get, uh, we'll get weeds and uh, not the fruit that we want. And so it's very important to kind of put in that effort. Okay, so let's dive in. First one is, uh, sounds a little bit boring, but uh, thriving couples have to have a pretty good friendship. And this is based on some research by a guy named John Gottman. Some of you have probably heard of him. He is a, a mathematician out of University of Washington and became a researcher in couples. So some of the data I'll share uh, with you tonight is, is from his, his uh, work. But in general, when we're dating and we're in courtship, we're, you know, we're showing interest, we're asking a lot of questions, and we're putting money in an emotional bank account. We're just we're doing all the things. We're putting our best foot forward. But a lot of times that starts to fade. And so you want to kind of keep that going. I'm, I'm curious by a raise of hands, how many of you have uh, heard or seen this formula? Five to one, positive to negative, interaction rate. I'm just curious. Okay, okay, about maybe a quarter of you. So this is interesting data from John Gottman, and this actually relates with most relationships. Thriving relationships, at the very least, have a five to one positive to negative interaction ratio. So meaning, now positive doesn't mean that you're running home and giving a big hug and roses, etc. okay? 
It might mean, hey, did you read about Trump in the paper? Oh yeah, it's crazy. Might be something as, as just normal as that, but you're just, you're interacting with one another. Now, this does not mean that healthy couples tend to do the, those five things and they can land a zinger and then go on to another five things. Those couples are not in good shape. Generally, healthy couples are around 200 to one, so to speak, okay? So be careful with uh, just thinking, well, I got that five in today and now maybe I can really tell her or him how I feel. So be careful with that one. Beware of the four horsemen. You know, this, this is interesting data because couples that are skilled at uh, these four things right here, the four horsemen, have a 93% chance of divorce. Did I wake anyone up? So, okay, so this, this is a big deal. Now, most of us do these four horsemen maybe monthly, and that's okay. Doesn't mean you have to go home and do them now. But if you're living this way, they can cause major problems. So I've got a separate slide for the four horsemen that I'll come back to and we'll go through it. And then in general, small little steps make profound differences. Believe it or not, one of my homework assignments to some couples that have been just disengaged for years is, uh, it's, you know, if I'm meeting with one of the spouses is, why don't you go home tonight and just give your spouse a seven second kiss when you greet her or him. Now that might sound like, well, yeah, what's that gonna do? Well, I'd say nine times out of 10, you'll have a better night than if you just go home and go, what have you been doing tonight? You know, looking around at the dirty room. So small steps can make a big, a big difference. So let's look at the four horsemen here. Criticism, defensiveness, contempt, stonewalling. This is almost the anatomy of divorce. So the first thing that usually happens is criticism. Criticism is different than feedback to your partner. We all have to give feedback to each other about our behaviors. However, criticism is kind of a character assassination of the person. It's name calling, it's saying things like, you're just like your mother, uh, those types of things that really kind of characterize the person and hurt their character versus feedback like, hey, you were late last night, I don't appreciate that, can you change that behavior? That's different. So criticism usually comes first, and then a lot of times defensiveness will come around because if there's a lot of criticism, a lot of times people are gonna start feeling like, boy, as soon as that garage door opens, I gotta be, I gotta be ready. And if you're feeling defensive a lot of the times, what happens next is the feelings of contempt for one another, and that's basically just feeling disgust for your partner. Now we've all rolled our eyes, but if that's a habitual thing for you to do, even metaphorically like, oh my gosh, not again. Uh, disgust and contempt is kinda, you know, maybe floating around in your soul a little bit. We've gotta be careful with that. The last step that generally happens is stonewalling, which is basically just emotionally checking out. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a mathematician to figure out if those four things are going on quite consistently with you, you do have a really high chance of divorce. So it's very important to try to change some of those behaviors. And we're gonna be talking about things that you can do if you are doing those, okay? So that's the first one, friendship. The next skill is to avoid the divorce landmines. There are two high points of divorce within 20 years. One comes at uh, around five years. If you, again, if you can see this, this time is going along this way in years, relationship quality zero to 10 here. So one's right around five uh, to six years. And the other one is right around 15 to 16 years. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. Any guesses as to why that first one is quite prevalent? Right around five to six years. It's not the seven year itch, it's more like the five, all the way in the back. Yell it out. Okay, okay, Bar barely heard you, I picked up on the last point. Very good, any, any other? So what's this point? What's, what's the, what did you say? The, the, the first point, could you repeat that? I couldn't hear the first. Okay, 
So uh, children might be an issue here. What the researchers have found is that a couple things happen. So let's look right at the beginning here. What do we all go through? Generally, a, a big dose of dopamine is flowing through our brain. And I actually call infatuation a, a good old meth high uh, because that's what it is. Research has shown that our brains almost mimic a cocaine meth high when we're in love uh, or even kind of a, in the throes of OCD. They have found that people that are in that first infatuation love stage, which is great, it's good stuff. It's, you know, if you could sell it on the streets, you'd be, you'd be quite rich. But it doesn't tell us the truth about the relationship. So it's good to have, but a lot of times what happens is most of us feel like, now when I'm working with couples that are in that infatuation stage and they're coming in for premarital therapy and I go through this, what do you think they're thinking when I show them that, that green line? What's that? Yes, thank you. They're, they, and they won't even, they won't tell me that. But inside they're saying, we're different than the rest of these folks. So don't, don't worry about this. So a lot of times they're thinking that they're just going to drift off into heaven and they're a little bit different than the rest. We're not going to follow this curve. Okay? Now don't get too depressed about this curve right here because this does not happen to everyone. This happens if you neglect your marriage. But early on that infatuation hits around 12 months to 3 years it tends to fade a little bit. Now when you tell young couples that, they go, well, no, not us. But it does tend to fade, just like a good drug does. And my wife and I actually call uh, this next stage the you deceived me stage. It's like, I didn't really, you know, what, what is this? What are you talking about? Uh, I didn't know you burped that loud. Wow. Uh, there's all sorts of things that start to get discovered and actually, what happens when you start to feel like you've been deceived? What are you thinking about your marriage? You married the wrong person. Now, I know none of you have thought that, right? Uh, or said that out loud. But uh, those, of the, those of us that uh, you know, have been part of the study, we probably start thinking that. And a lot of times what happens in that uh, fifth year is people start making a case to bail on a marriage. Now you're right, kids, money, paying bills, all those things kind of start to take away from the infatuation and a lot of people bail around five years. Now, any, again, any guesses as to what goes on here? Whoop, sorry. Now again, I got carried away with my PowerPoint skills, but in general, what happens is people that tend to survive this you deceive me stage and go to work on their marriage usually flatten out and they tend to move out here. So I frankly think this is where love exists out here. This is a meth high. This is a Diet Coke buzz. Okay? It's a little bit different. But if you're feeling like you're going to have to have that meth, you probably will be a serial monogamous and you'll continue to try to chase that. It just isn't part of real marriages generally, okay? So a couple of reasons for the divorce rate going up around 15 and 16 years is that people, if they're lucky enough to have kids, they have two roles. They have the spousal role and the marital role or and the parental role. What do you think happens to the spousal role when kids start coming around? Starts to fade. And what I see a lot of times is par parents really get into the parenting thing and they put their marriage on a shelf and when their kids start to leave the nest a little bit, parents are looking across the room at each other going, really? <laughs> and so I get a lot of couples that come in around this stage. So my suggestion here is go to work as much as you can around this area, which is what we're going to be talking about the, the next few skills. Okay? Okay, beware of the marital myths. Here are some marital myths. I married my soulmate. Why would that be a myth? That's actually kind of a nice, sexy idea. But what is the potential problem with that? Anyone? What's that? You find out they're not perfect. And I'm sorry to say this, but you probably have not 
met, you know, your spouse in a cosmic way where all your parts just magically fit together. If you believe that, you will be very, very upset the first time you disagree. So my, I love the, what my wife says, you grow into soulmates, you may not marry them. Okay? So you, sometimes you have to work at that. Marriage should make me happy. Well, no, it shouldn't. That puts too much pressure on your par partner to be your psychotherapist and entertainment chairman. You must walk in the door of marriage happy if you want to be. Conflict in marriage is harmful and should be avoided. I had a couple recently that had been married for 23 years, had sworn to me they had never raised their voices and never had a fight. And they're talking to lawyers right now. They're getting divorced. So what happened to them? They imploded. They weren't able to communicate. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about communication in just a second. Loneliness and boredom will be cured by marriage. Again, that's setting your partner up to be your entertainment chairman. That's dangerous. We must do everything together to stay happily married. I don't know about you, that that gets my gag reflex going a little bit. I love my wife to death, but I like to do things on my own as well. Children will hold a failing marriage together. I love my two kids, but the research indicates the more and more kids you have, the more you really have to work on your marriage. So, so be ready, because they are challenging. It takes a lot of energy. And then loving behavior should only be done when it feels genuine and natural. Uh-oh, this is where I'm gonna get in trouble. Uh, in general, females kind of believe this a little bit, and guys are going, I need a cue card, honey. I'm not quite sure what, uh, what you need and want. This is a little bit dangerous because sometimes, if you live with one another for 20 years, you're gonna to start to get this, but a lot of times we sometimes need to tell each other what we need and want you did not marry uh, your, you know, you, a mind reader. And the la last one, a, a sure sign of true love is if my spouse instinctively knows what I need and want in a relationship. So be careful with that, right? Mother's Day and Father's Day, we often have a lot of fights around that. Like, how could you not know this? So be careful with the marital myths. By raise of hands, how many of you have read or are familiar with the five love languages? Oh my gosh, look at that, half the crowd. This is a Utah favorite book. And as physicians, you should at least be aware of it. So if you have patients that are struggling, that is one thing you could, be, you could just kind of suggest, go read that five love language book uh, by Gary Chapman. Very simple uh, book. Here's the metaphor. We all have love tanks inside of us. When our love tanks are full, of love. We tend to interact with one another and we feel safe and trusting. Great. But when our tanks start to get a bit empty, we often fight much more and conflict starts to ensue and people start to drift apart. So here's the trick, is not everyone speaks the same language or has the same fuel needs that you do. So let me give you an example. So here are the five, I think there's 500 love languages, but uh, Gary Chapman uh, hones them down to five. First one is quality time. That could be anything for a, a lot of folks. For my wife, that would be sitting down and talking about her third grade class, okay? Not my favorite topic on the planet. In fact, it's down about 500, okay? But nor is my topics that important to her as well. So quality time is a little bit different. For guys, a lot of times it's, you know, I just want my partner to go skiing with me or fishing, etc. So it's a little bit different. Acts of service is just doing things for one another. Physical touch, guys, this is not about sexual intercourse. Other, otherwise, most, people, most guys would say, well, yeah, mine's physical touch. Uh, physical touch is proximity, uh, cuddling, just holding hands, those types of things. Gifts is, a, is pretty self-explanatory. And then words of affirmation are just kind words to one another, okay? Let me give you an example. My wife, very high on uh, words of affirmation and quality time. Now, as I take the little uh, quiz that, that Gary Chapman has, those two are my bottom. They're at the bottom of my list. I am a strong acts of service person. So. Here's the trick. Most of us give the love that we want to receive. So an acts of service guy like me, 
I'm vacuuming a lot and I'm doing a lot of work and, and then occasionally I'll get my wife say, are you into me or you do love me? And I'll be going, are you kidding me? Have you, have you not seen me do all this work? So what is happening there is I'm filling her full of the love that I need and not necessarily what she needs. This happens in every marriage. So I would just suggest, we won't belabor the point here, but if you leave with one thing tonight, it would be this little phrase right here and try to fill in the blanks. When I do blank, my spouse feels loved. Now, you can go online and take this 10-page assessment to find out your love languages. I would suggest you don't need to. You could simply turn to your spouse now, we don't have to do it, or go home tonight and ask them, when, you, you know, when was the last time you felt kind of loved and appreciated by me? Uh, last year, sometime. Really? Okay. Uh, what was I doing? And you will start to figure out what her love, his love language is. Does that make sense? And it doesn't mean you can be tri bilingual. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to do, to do this. But that's one phrase I suggest most couples uh, address with one another. And in general, you want to be asking, when people read that book, by the way, they read it wrong. And, and here's how they read it. They read it and they start highlighting it. And who are they highlighting it for? They've got it dog-eared and everything. They leave it out, you know, kind of, you know, by the coffee table. It's dog-eared and... Honey, you ought to check that. It's all the things that their partner should be doing. Okay? It's not the best way to read it. You should be reading it as, what are some things that I could do a little bit different? And then a lot of times you can get that reciprocated. Okay? Make sense? Has anyone had s some success with the five love languages just in their own personal marriage? Okay. Pretty simple idea. And uh, if you're struggling a lot, that's one of the first places I would go is what could I do a little bit different that might be helpful and see if we can get things rolling on the, on the marriage front. The last little piece here. So I've got Dr. Phil up there uh, for a reason. And this is one of my favorite ideas because it's helped me quite a bit in my own marriage. And that is uh, we all have recipes in our head, lists of how we think life should be and how people should behave. And these come from our genetic background, from our socioeconomic background, religious background, political, etc. And they're listed in our heads from most important to least important. Okay? So, uh, for instance, and, and so what happens with a, with a lot of couples is when we are first married, we often call marital therapists call that, those the blueprint wars first three or four years, because you're bringing in uh, different blueprints and trying to blend them. The worst fight my wife and I ever had was our first Christmas. It was a couple weeks before Christmas, and it was in a Christmas tree parking lot in Provo, Utah, and it almost came to blows. And it was about whether or not we were to get a flock tree or an all-natural tree, which is what our family did, and that is the truth. Uh, and it got kind of nasty. Now that is a great example of a blueprint issue. Now couples that start to believe, as an individual, if you start to believe that your blueprints are the truth and not opinion, you will start to have more conflict in your life. Now, I'm not saying there aren't facts and truths in life, and, and not all recipes are created equal, but if you start to feel like, again, your recipes are the truth, we usually communicate like this. Just shut up and listen to the pearls of wisdom coming from my mouth and receive them and everything will be okay. That's generally how we, we react or uh, communicate. Versus couples that view their recipes as recipes, usually communicate way better and with more humility and more compromise. Now, I'm not saying there aren't deal breaker recipes. I had a couple about five years ago, a local couple, where she was uh, of the uh, Mormon faith and high up in the, the leadership. 
and uh, he was not, and he, he had a, about a 10 by 20 plot of pot in his backyard. Are there any officers here? I'm not going to tell you where, where these people live, but, uh, but he, uh, he was growing a, a pretty good uh, stash of marijuana. Uh, that was a deal breaker recipe for her, okay? So there are, there, there's deal breaker recipes that occur, but I would say a majority of divorces are based on uh, recipe clashes that could be resolved in general, okay? So think about, think about that for a second. Let me just give you a, a, a couple of examples. So I grew up in a clean freak home where my mom uh, had me vacuuming at age five. I mean, just, you know, all over the place. And so vacuuming is kind of a, like a top five recipe for me, okay? It's up there. Now my wife is way more clean, orderly, structured uh, than I am. I'm kind of a mess. However, uh, her recipe for vacuuming is probably around 250. Okay, it's down there. Now, let me ask you a couple unfair questions, trick questions. Who do you think does most of the vacuuming? Yes, I do. Yeah, of course. It's, you know, I jump out of bed and go, where's the Hoover? You know, so it's, it's way up there. Uh, now, is that fair? I knew I'd stump you. Is that fair? What's that? Okay, it doesn't have to be fair. It just has to work. Very pragmatic. Some people said yes. Now, I think it was a female voice, by the way. Uh, yes, yes. What's up? It's important to me. You got it. So here's the, here's the trick. Do you think uh, I have ever converted her to enjoy the Hoover like I do? No. I mean, I've, t I've shown her different styles and different ways, and she's still not getting out of bed going, where is it? You know? So w that's one of the things, and, you, and if you think about some of the recipes that are going on in your own relationships, it happens all, uh, all the time. So, you know, beware of those, and if you, the more you can put those above the table and talk about them, and negotiate a little bit. Now, if I ask my wife to vacuum, nine times out of 10, oh yeah. But I can't just demand that she becomes me. And as uh, marital partners, we have to realize that we did not marry our identical twins. They have different recipes, different blueprints, and if you get those on top of the table and talk about them, you'll be able to respect one another and hopefully you can navigate some of those types of things. Okay, does that make sense? Can any of you think of any blueprints that are going on in your current marriages that you wanna share? Come on, someone be brave. I just, I just exposed my vacuuming you know, fetish. So what's that? No fake trees? You have, you have that? What about, does Santa wrap presents or does he just lay them around? That one has not been a fight. Well, uh, what about, uh, well, m many times there's uh, how to spend, uh, how to spend recreational time, or do you work before play or play before work? There's all sorts of recipe differences that are important to talk about and try to do your best uh, to uh, not look at them as necessarily truth. Holidays, here's some examples. Holidays, leisure time, likes, desires, religion, parenting. Those are all fair game to be talking about as opinions uh, versus truth. Okay? All right. I think that, uh, yeah, that, those are the big five. So we got friendship, avoid the divorce landmines, beware the marital myths, love languages, and recipe wars. With, again, the thread that if you're intentionally trying to nourish your relationship, you'll be in better shape than those that are just sitting back. I've listed a few books that are some of my favorites. We don't have to go through all of them. Uh, if your marriage is sex starved, you can go buy that one uh, by Michelle Wiener Davis. Um, the Medical Marriage is a little bit dated. I think there's a new edition that is quite helpful. This is John Gottman's book. It's quite good. The latest research that I quoted uh, comes from uh, this book for better. There's the old five love languages. So hopefully this information has been helpful 
for you. Uh, Ed, before I get off the stage here, any questions that uh, you have that I can try to answer before I depart? Yes, right here. Any advice for blended families? This, fa this fan is noisy. Blended families, when you get remarried, have Yeah, blended families. So you know this recipe thing? That you, you, you have to turn up the volume on those efforts quite a bit with blended families because you're, you're blending great big blueprints with past history, et cetera. Uh, assets and finances are, are a big deal. Uh, actually, Utah State University has a nice consortium of information on their website of step parenting, step family information that's probably, I think, some of the best in the nation. If you just go on to their website, they have a website on step family information. But it's a, it's a big process, it's very difficult. And I would say this, that the best gift you can give your kids, whether they're biological kids, step kids, adopted, etc., is a good marriage. A lot of people think that they just drift off into parenting, but nurturing that marriage is one of the best gifts you can give. So, yes? Yeah, we need to go to the mic. Oh. Questions, Questions to the mic. So as a therapist or a doctor, it seems like you're we're in the business of trying to save marriages usually. Um, can you comment on at what point do you recommend a, a split, that, it, that that's the best solution? Okay, yeah, great. Uh, in, in general, yes, I'm very, and I tell couples this right up front, uh, I, I got in this business for a reason and it's generally to, to save marriages. Uh, however, there, there's two instances for sure uh, domestic violence, when, that, when it becomes uh, quite prevalent uh, and it doesn't look like it's going to end, uh, not, not good for the kids or any, anything, anyone else. And then uh, heavy drug, alcohol abuse. Uh, generally, if that's, if that's getting really messy, those are two areas. If those aren't changing, I'm usually you know, asking them, what, what's the point of staying in this? I will say this, when, when couples do have kids, uh, I do try to push as much as I can because kids generally do better. They, kids don't care that much if you're fighting. They don't want to hear it. And they don't care you know, how romantic you are or anything like that. They just want access to both of you. And so I usually push parents to really try if they do have biological kids that are pretty young. But those are generally the two areas, uh, domestic violence and uh, drug and alcohol abuse. Yes? Question, uh, if you have a patient in your um, office and, the, and you tell them to go to counseling, they say, my husband absolutely will not go to counseling. Yes. Do you still recommend they go to counseling, or is there any way to influence the other spouse to come to counseling? Or? Yes, great, fantastic question. Mm -hmm. A majority of marital therapy that I do is with individuals, unfortunately. I'd, I'd prefer it other ways, but it's just not practical. So the research is very clear. Uh, there's an article out of a, a psychotherapy journal called uh, It Takes One to Tango, and, and it's all about the research that suggests if you get because couples are a system. If you can change one person, it sometimes will have a ripple effect on that other person. It's obviously better for me and I'm more successful if both people do come in. But if someone's totally being dragged in, I just soon maybe just talk with the person that really wants some help. And a lot of times they'll have, it doesn't sound fair and it probably isn't, but that's the customer that really wants some help. And so I will work with those individuals. And believe it or not, uh, quite a bit of success can happen that, that way. But in general, if I can have both partners there, it's the best. Yep. But I would still recommend it for individuals to at least go talk, talk with a, a therapist about that. Any other, any other questions? Okay. Hey, thank you for your time. Enjoy your evening and thanks for having me. Thank you. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you.